at Art and Epidemics, a virtual tour of the Cleveland Museum of Art that makes interesting connections between artworks and epidemics that have occurred over the course of history, including the COVID-19 pandemic. Hello and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Digital Programming. I'm Ben Spagan and I'm the Vice President at the JES and I'm a Contributing Editor at the Erie Reader. Before we get to her presentation, a bit about the presenter. Uh, Linda Sandhouse, MD, graduated from the New York University School of Medicine in 1978 and completed her residency in fellowship training in pathology at the University of Minnesota. She received her master's in science in biostatistics and epidemiology from Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine in 2000. She retired from University Hospitals of Cleveland in 2017 and is currently Emeritus Associate Professor of Pathology at CWRU School of Medicine. After retiring, Linda became a docent at the Cleveland Museum of Art, where she enjoys giving tours to children and adults. For a fuller bio, please head over to our website, jeserie.org. Uh, in this Zoom webinar, uh, we'll be working our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you have a question, please use the Q&A function. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, unfortunately, we can't take your questions there, so we invite you over to this Zoom webinar, the link to which is available on our website, jeserie.org. Uh, of course, if you're listening to or watching a later broadcast of this program, still send us your questions, your comments to keep this conversation going. Also, Dr. Sandhouse will be conducting three polls throughout her presentation. Uh, we'll use the poll function here in that webinar for that. Again, folks watching on YouTube, we encourage you to head over to our website, grab that link, jeserie.org. Uh, there you can participate in the polls for today's program by joining this webinar. Linda's going to walk us through that as we get to those sections. And of course, for more information about upcoming JES programs and publications, do visit our website, jeserie.org, and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Linda Sandhouse to the JES Digital Stage. Dr. Sandhouse, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us here today. Well, thank you, Ben, for that introduction, and it's my pleasure to be with you and the Jefferson Education Society today. Let me begin by sharing my screen. Always a challenge. <laughs> We've all grown accustomed to this. We thank you. We give you the time. Uh, it looks terrific, Dr. Sandhouse. Uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Well, welcome, everyone. Art and Epidemics is a virtual tour that uses artworks in the Cleveland Museum of Art collection to make connections with epidemics that have occurred in the course of history. These art and epidemic associations are a starting point for exploring the impact of epidemics on Western art through the ages. And since this is a virtual tour, we'll be able to drop in on some other art museums around the world. <clears throat> For those of you who haven't been to the Cleveland Museum of Art, uh, I want to remind you that it's a, it's a worthwhile trip from, from Erie and it's free to all the people all the time. The major epidemics and pandemics that we'll be considering today on this tour are listed here in alphabetical order. They are AIDS, bubonic plague, cholera, COVID-19, dysentery, influenza, malaria, smallpox, and tuberculosis. During the talk, you will have three opportunities to participate by responding to the question, which epidemic do you associate with this artwork? The connection might be with the location depicted in the artwork, the historical time period, the activities depicted in the artwork, or even with the artist. In his book, Epidemics and Society, Frank Snowden states that pandemics are major drivers of history on par with war and economic upheavals. Some pandemics had a major impact on culture and the arts. To be clear, these pandemics impacted all of the arts, but I will limit my talk to the visual arts. And we will see that the societal responses to COVID-19 that we've all experienced are remarkably similar to societal responses to epidemics that occurred long before people had any inkling that they were caused by microorganisms. The first artwork on our tour is this microscope, which is dear to my heart because in my professional life, I was a pathologist and the microscope was the tool of my trade. 
Why is it a microscope in an art museum at all? Its ornamentation reflects the intermingling of art and science that was typical during the European Age of Enlightenment in the late 18th century. At that time, there wasn't such a clear distinction between art and the natural sciences as there is today. Royalty and aristocrats collected scientific instruments, artworks, and natural flora in their Kunstkammers or cabinets of curiosities to demonstrate that they were keeping up with the intellectual and scientific progress of the times. This elaborate microscope with gold ornamentation probably belonged to a wealthy aristocrat who perhaps fancied himself an amateur scientist. Technological improvements in the magnifying lenses of microscopes in the 19th century led to the discovery of bacteria. So we can connect this microscope with plague, cholera, tuberculosis, dysentery, and malaria, because these are diseases caused by microbes that can be seen with the modern light microscope. The top image shows the bacteria first isolated and proven to be the cause of cholera by the German physician, Robert Koch. Koch traveled to India in 1883 during a cholera epidemic to isolate the microbe and definitively prove that it was the causative agent. He also discovered Mycobacterium tuberculosis in 1882. But it took the invention of the electron microscope in the 1930s to provide the level of magnification that's required to see viruses, which are much smaller than bacteria. So the viruses would include HIV, the cause of AIDS, coronaviruses, influenza, and variella, the cause of smallpox. So this black and white image shows coronaviruses being released from a cell into this space. So these are the little coronavirus particles right here. And the resolution is just barely enough for you to make out those little spike proteins that we've heard so much about in the last year. The experiments of Louis Pasteur in France and Robert Koch and Carl Zeiss in Germany led to the discovery of bacteria, and this marks the beginning of modern medicine. Their work proved that there were specific causes for specific diseases and soon put to rest the vague theories of miasma and effluvia, which were non-scientific explanations. Pasteur and Koch became arch scientific rivals and both contributed to major advances in our understanding of infectious diseases. Famous research institutes in each country bear their names and to this day are leaders in medical research, including research on the SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. The public, us, <laughs> often benefit from intense scientific rivalries such as theirs. A similar rivalry between Robert Gallo in the United States and Luc Montagnier in France led to the rapid discovery of HIV as the cause of AIDS in 1983. Recently, we have all benefited from the race to produce vaccines against the coronavirus, which has resulted in the availability of several vaccines in less than a year. The next artwork on our tour is this painting of Piazza San Marco, Venice, attributed to Bellato in about 1740. Bernardo Bellato was the nephew and student of Canaletto, who ran one of the most productive painting workshops in Italy. Like his uncle, Bellato specialized in views of Italy, especially Venice, which were purchased avidly by British aristocrats on their grand tour of Europe. Recent visitors to the CMA have noticed the social distancing that seems to have been practiced at that time in Venice, and also that some of the visitors to Venice were dressed in the Turkish style, but you'll have to visit the CMA in person to appreciate these details. So now I'd like to call up my first poll and ask you all, um, which epidemic do you associate with this painting? And I'll give you a clue the connection is with the city of Venice, but during an earlier time period. So you can make your selection and submit your poll, and I'll give you about 30 seconds to do that, and uh, then I'll share the results with you.
And Linda, while we're waiting, I'd like to take this moment to, to again remind folks, if you're watching on our YouTube page, um, uh, to be able to participate in the next poll, we're going to encourage you to head over to the JES Erie uh, website, jeserie.org. Uh, so there you can snag that link to, to get into the webinar version of this program. Uh, that way you can participate in the next poll. Uh, some folks watching over there. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll certainly hear some reaction to this first poll. Uh, but folks, we'd encourage you to go over there to our website uh, to join via webinar. Linda, back over to you. Thanks. And also, I'll point out that the, your responses are anonymous, so don't be shy. But also, we like to say there are no wrong answers in the art museum. There's more than one right answer here, but there's one that I will discuss. Okay, well, it looks like all of the responses are submitted. So I'm going to end the poll now and share the results with you. And we have a 50-50 split here between bubonic plague and cholera, both very good associations to this artwork. Okay, so <clears throat> moving on. The connection that I would like to make with this artwork is with bubonic plague. <clears throat> The Black Death refers to the second pandemic of bubonic plague that entered Europe about 1347 and killed approximately one third of the population over the next five years. It is considered by some historians to be the greatest catastrophe that has yet befallen the human race. Modern research suggests that plague started somewhere in Asia and spread east and west over centuries along the Silk Road trade routes. The bacteria thrive in burrowing rodents, such as rats. The infected rodents traveled with the caravans, infecting underground rodent colonies all along the way, and the fleas that suck the blood of the infected animals. When these infected animals came in contact with humans, the infected fleas deserted the dead hosts and jumped on the people. It is thought that Genghis Khan and his army brought plague to the Eurasian steppes around the Black Sea. Europeans and Mongols came in contact in this region and then transported plague by sea to Sicily, Genoa, Naples, and Venice, which were the major ports of entry of plague into Europe. Venice was a very wealthy and powerful city state, largely due to its vast trade network with the East. It's interesting that in the current pandemic, Italy was once again the major point of entry of the disease into the continent of Europe from the East. Public health began in Italy with the plague. The word quarantine comes from the Italian word for 40. The Italians got the idea from the Bible, specifically from the way lepers were ostracized. The duration of 40 days also comes directly from the Bible. Ragusa in Sicily and Venice in Italy were the first ports to introduce quarantines for all incoming ships, cargo, and persons. Lazarettos were islands in the Venetian lagoon that were designated for quarantine, and you can still visit them today. A sanitary cordon was a military barrier to enforce the quarantine. So the crew, passengers, and cargo were housed in the lazarettos for 40 days, and many contracted plague and died there. There were no lazarettos to quarantine all the passengers and crew that were stranded one year ago on cruise ships searching for ports that would accept them. However, some of the cruise lines used their private islands in the Caribbean as way stations for their crews until they could figure out how to get them home. A version of Lazaretto and sanitary cordon was used in Australia, where visitors and Australians returning from abroad were escorted by military personnel directly from their airplanes to the hotels designated for mandatory quarantine. This image is an engraving of, of a Venetian physician's personal protective equipment, or PPE. The wand and the mask <clears throat> would allow him to examine a patient while maintaining, maintaining some degree of social distancing. It's interesting to compare societal responses to the plague with our responses to COVID-19. The best way to avoid the plague was to run from it. And so anyone who could leave the cities did so they found that the countryside was not welcoming. 
In, Lon in the London epidemic of 1665, city authorities ordered street cleaning, but none of the cleaning was effective because they were so in the dark about how the disease was spreading. And you might recall the videos that we saw of streets being sprayed with disinfectant uh, early on in the COVID pandemic. And this spraying with disinfectant has also been shown to be ineffective. Given the shutdown of the local economies and massive unemployment, there was often a breakdown in law and order during plague outbreaks. While divine punishment was accepted as the cause of plague, people still looked for humans they could blame, and the Jews were the most obvious targets. The Jews were accused of poisoning the wells and other anti-Christian conspiracies, which led to widespread persecution in the form of mass lynchings, burnings, and expulsions. Pope Clement opposed this persecution in a papal bull and pointed out that the Jews were also afflicted by the plague, but his words were unheeded amid the widespread hysteria. The impact of the plague on the church was complex. Initially, it strengthened the church and religion, and a lot of religious art was commissioned by the church and wealthy patrons in response to the plague. On the other hand, it decimated the monasteries and new monks were recruited, some of which were not drawn to the church with the purest of motives. In his book, Plagues and Peoples, McNeil speculates that these mass recruitments may have contributed to corruption in the church. The impact of the plague on art is huge. For nearly 500 years, everyone in Europe lived in the shadow of the plague and the knowledge that it could strike their city at any time and life as they knew it would be over. This includes all the great masters of the Renaissance and Baroque periods. I want to show examples of three genres or types of art that we can attribute directly to bubonic plague and that have continued in the visual arts until the present day. These are the dance of death and triumph of death, memento mori or reminders of death, and saint paintings. The triumph of death refers to an image of death as a skeleton or a decomposing body bearing a scythe or bow and arrow and descending from the sky on horseback. This is Peter Bruegel the Elder's interpretation of the triumph of death, which is at the, muse uh, the Prado Museum in Madrid. Death appears in the center here as a skeleton on horseback. And I'm going to enlarge that for you so you can see that even the horse appears almost skeletonized. Although imaginary, this painting depicts the reality that no level of society was spared from the plague, rich or poor, even the priests here on the left are skeletons. And you see in the background that the landscape is just a wasteland with a, a, a expansive scene of destruction. There's an army of skeletons here and citizens are being pushed into a large crate, which is eerily foreshadowing the crematoriums of Auschwitz. It's a terrifying image that expresses the level of fear that people lived with while the plague which was raging. Here are two 20th century paintings from the CMA collection that draw on the triumph of death imagery. Ryder's painting on the left, the racetrack or death on a pale horse depicts a horse race in which death is the only competitor. The horse is running in the opposite direction of a usual horse race. This may symbolize the race of death that we are all running. Death is always running towards us as the time between us and our death is becoming progressively shorter. Aaron Douglas's painting, Go Down Death, is based on a poem by the same title in which God sends death to bring Sister Caroline to him. Here, death has been transformed from a threatening image into a winged angel on horseback. This frightening interpretation of the triumph of death is by the Swiss symbolist painter Arnold Bachlin, which he called Plague 1898, in reference to plague that broke out in Bombay, India that year. A monstrous, cadaverous appearing death rides a winged bat-like creature and sweeps through a medieval bit, a village, striking down those in his path with his deadly sickle. The bat foreshadows the novel coronavirus that probably came from bats. 
we have this painting, Ruined by the Sea by Bachlin at the CMA. Medieval paintings of the dance of death typically show a procession of persons from all strata of society, alternating with grinning and prancing skeletons that appear to be mocking them. A century later, Hans Holbein designed a series of woodcut, woodcuts on the dance of death um, that are uh, owned by the CMA. Uh, instead of a continuous pageant, each representative of society is printed on a separate page, allowing for more personal reflection by the viewer in the form of a book. I selected a few images from the CMA collection online. The first image called The Count depicts death as a rampaging peasant attacking a wealthy count who's running for his life. And the second image called the sailor, we see death climbing on board the ship, breaking the mast, and the sailors are ready to jump all overboard. And in the third, the abbot is being dragged away by a grinning skeleton wearing a bishop's mitre. By the way, Hans Holbein died of bubonic plague in 1543. This bridal couple is by an anonymous German artist from the 15th century. The back panel, which is at a museum in Strasbourg, France, is a memento mori or a reminder of death and shows the gruesome images of the couple's decaying bodies. The small image here that you see on the right is from the label hanging in the museum, but the actual painting shows their entire bodies covered with insects and other crawling creatures. Yuck. It's unimaginable to us today why anyone would want such a horrifying reminder of death on their wedding portrait. We have the bubonic plague to thank for that. Now, memento mori are found throughout uh, artworks in the CMA collection and many other museums. Uh, this is an example the, from the tapestries, the Chaumont tapestries, and these are large woven tapestries hanging uh, in one room. There's a set of three of them, and you can see that there are skulls hiding in the jackets of these two gentlemen. I'll show you an enlargement here, and these skulls are memento mori and remind us that these two men were deceased at the time that this tapestry was made. In this painting by William Michael Harnett, um, the skull, the extinguished candle, and the spent hourglass are all symbols of death. A quote from William Shakespeare's Hamlet inscribed on the inside cover of a tattered book reinforces this theme. The quote comes from the play's famous graveyard scene where Hamlet discovers a skull and grimly ponders his beloved Ophelia, ironically unaware that she's already dead. And this is the speech that begins, alas, poor Yorick, I knew him. Finally, here are two memento mori from uh, the 20th and uh, 20th century. Laments on the left belongs to Jenny Holzer's sculpture series that she made in response to the AIDS epidemic in 1987. The series is based on 13 poems that she wrote and in, in which she described as the voices of the dead. Each poem is expressed in two forms as an LED light display scrolling upwards. So if you were to see this in person at the museum, you would see the words of the poem scrolling, just like the lights on Broadway. And then they're also engraved on this marble sarcophagus. So she's combining a very contemporary form of, of uh, tri tri tribute and also a sort of an ancient form in the form of a marble sarcophagus. And the words of this poem, I really like the metaphor of the rat that she uses, quote, death came and he looked like a rat with claws, because this again reminds us of the bubonic plague. Uh, recall that AIDS was initially called the gay plague. On the right in Unentitled, the artist Felix Gonzalez Torres uses a pair of gradually extinguishing light bulbs and their intertwined cords to represent himself and his deceased lover in this very personal expression of loss to the AIDS epidemic. The artist himself died of AIDS five years later. <clears throat> 
So moving on to saint paintings, sufferers of the plague commonly prayed to saints to intercede for them. And two of the most important saints are Saint Sebastian and Saint Roque. Sebastian was a Christian martyr who was sentenced to die for his faith by the Roman emperor Diocletian, who ordered him tied to a post and shot to death by arrows. During the Middle Ages, he became a popular saint to pray to during plague epidemics. He epitomizes the suffering Christian, and some saw similarities between his arrow wounds and the bulbous source of the plague. On the left is the 1493 drawing of St. Sebastian by Perugino from the CMA collection that was recently displayed during the Michelangelo exhibit. On the right, we see the fully realized painting that was based on this drawing and that now hangs in the Louvre in Paris. Perugino died of plague in 1523. Here is Giorgione's gentler interpretation of St. Sebastian. This is a small painting and was probably commissioned for private devotion. Giorgione him also died of plague in Venice in 1510. Now this is a monstrous, a monstrous or uh, it is intended to show a relic and it's from uh, uh, the, I think the uh, 1400s, yeah. 1400s, and this was purchased by the CMA in 1930, and it is said to contain a relic of Saint Sebastian, and indeed there is a bone from the foot in this relic, in this in the reliquary in the center right here. Um, and if you come to the museum, you can actually see that bone. This reliquary was first displayed on the altar of the Church in a, of Saint Blaise in Brunswick, Germany, in a penitential mass on June 4th. 1484 in an effort to ward off the plague. Okay, now Tintoretto painted the ceiling of the Gran Scuola San Rocco shown here on the left in Venice in 1564. And so this was um, uh, intended to honor Saint Roque. Uh, in this elliptical ceiling painting, um, we see the heroic figure of the saint surrounded by choirs of angels. And here's the story of St. Roque. As a Christian pilgrim, he traveled throughout Italy, healing those suffering from the plague, and eventually became infected himself. He was healed by a dog who licked his sores and brought him bread. So as living proof that one could survive the plague, St. Roque was often called upon by sufferers to relieve them of bubonic plague and other diseases. Another painting in this uh, large room called St. Rock Healing the Plague Stricken, shows St. Rock here in the center with this halo, reaching out and touching one of the plague victims. And I want you to hold that image in your mind to compare to some uh, later painting that I'll show you. And over here, you can see some of the large bulbous sores typical of bubonic plague. <clears throat> Now, St. Rosalie was another saint. Um, she was the patron, patron saint of Palermo and Anthony Van Dyck happened, uh, the Dutch painter happened to be in Sicily when it was under lockdown for plague. And uh, he was commissioned to paint, I think about six paintings of St. Rosalie while he was there. Now, a medical student brought this image to my attention. This is the design for a chapel to honor the healthcare workers of Hubei province by artist Duhi Yahan and is entitled The Saints Wear White. Here, he envisions healthcare workers in full PPE as saints. So he's reimagining a Renaissance chapel as a modern chapel with the physicians as the saints. I thought that was a very striking image. Now I can't leave the topic of plague. I know I've talked quite a bit about the impact of, of the plague on art because um, there's a lot of it, but I can't leave this subject without sharing this very famous historical painting with you um, entitled Napoleon Bonaparte visiting the plague stricken at Jaffa. Napoleon is in the center here, arm extended and touching the sores of one of his soldiers, just like we saw in Tintoretto's painting of Saint Roque. And I'll show you an enlargement here of the center of the painting. Napoleon's gesture is intended to convey his noble character 
in addition to likening him to Christ. This is a political painting. Napoleon commissioned the painting for political purposes to be displayed shortly before his coronation as emperor. And before we leave this, just notice this soldier standing behind him who looks like he's trying to put on his mask. Okay, well, I think we've had enough of plague. <laughs> This is a, for a change of pace, this is a very delightful contemporary sculpture of wood and glass beads by the um, African artist from Cameroon named Hervé Yumbi. And it takes its inspiration from traditional African masks and sculptures. So the epidemic that I would like to discuss in relation to this artwork is malaria. <laughs> no other continent has been as impacted by infectious diseases as Africa, and probably no other disease has caused a greater burden of illness in the history of the human race than malaria. Malaria is an example of a disease that has become endemic rather than epidemic, meaning that it has come into an ecological balance with humans across a wide geographic distribution. In fact, it's, uh, malaria has evolved with humans and has impacted human evolution. Malaria was probably imported into the New World by Europeans in their blood, probably in the 1600s. Quinine extracted from the bark of the quinchona tree was known to suppress malaria symptoms as early as the 1650s. European colonization of Central Africa probably would not have been possible without a reliable supply of quinine from the Dutch plantations in Java. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine um, that were so controversial early on in the COVID epidemic are related compounds with anti-malarial effect. This is what malaria looks like in the blood. These are red blood cells and these little rings with the purple dots in them are the malaria parasites. Now, besides the chloroquine connection with COVID, there's another obvious connection with the totem and the traditional African arts, which is masks. Masks have once again become a popular form of artistic expression, as we can see in some of these artistic examples here that I've placed next to some of the traditional African masks that you can see in the CMA galleries today. Okay, moving on to our next artwork. This is our beloved portrait of George Washington at the Battle of Princeton um, that was uh, comm commissioned to commemorate this victory. Um, and Charles Wilson Peel is the artist. So this is time for our next poll. And it's the same question, which epidemic do you associate? Oops, I gotta go to the next one. Uh, let's see, cancel that. Okay. Uh, we need to go to poll number two. Here we go. All right. So which epidemic do you associate with this portrait of George Washington? And I'll give you a few seconds to respond. And while folks are taking the time to respond, I want to remind everybody uh, watching over on YouTube uh, live, uh, we'd welcome you over to the webinar. There's going to be one more poll. You'd get the chance to take uh, place in the third one. Uh, and of course, if you're watching or listening to a later broadcast of this, uh, folks, just guess along at home and you're going to find out whether or not uh, you may or may not be right uh, as we turn things back over to Linda. Back over to you, Linda. Okay, thank you. Well, I see we were we have uh, we're very shy, so I will tell you the the um, association that I've made with this painting is with, oops, smallpox. Smallpox rep replaced plague as the most dreaded disease in Europe in the 18th century due to its high mortality and disfigurement of survivors. It probably entered Europe during the Crusades and became endemic with periodic epidemics. Like many major epidemics, it is thought to have originated in India because this is where there was a large population living in close proximity to animals in a continually warm climate. These are conditions that are conducive to the spread of infections from animals to humans. It probably came from cows 
Europeans brought it to the new world where it had a devastating effect on the native population. The observation that no one was afflicted twice led to the practice of inoculation with pustular exudate from a mild case. Inoculation itself had a one to 2% risk of death. That so many people accepted this risk of death in order to be protected attests to the level of fear that this disease instilled in the population. George Washington, who had survived smallpox himself, understood the threat that it posed to his army and had his army inoculated against smallpox. And this was a top, top secret operation because of course he didn't want the British to know that his army was temporarily disabled while they were recovering from the inoculation. Uh, in England, Edward Jenner introduced the cowpox vaccine in 1798 and then Napoleon vaccinated his army in 1805. So it's interesting to speculate how uh, history might have changed if Napoleon's army had not been protected against smallpox. Smallpox was officially declared eradicated in 1980. This great public health achievement was the result of a worldwide vaccination program. Now recently, uh, I discovered another connection to smallpox in our museum. And it's this bust of the composer Christoph Gluck. Gluck was a German composer who came to France where he made his fortune. They loved his music there. And um, it, his, uh, the, the sculptor who did this uh, bust of him, uh, Jean-Antoine Houdon, was known for his uh, realism in depicting his subjects. And if you notice, his, his face has these pitted scars in it. And that is because Gluck was a survivor of smallpox. Okay, the next artwork on our tour is this painting by Winslow Homer called The Briarwood Pipe. So Winslow Homer was an American realist uh, painter. And during the Civil War, he worked as a war correspondent for Harper's Weekly embedded with the Union Army. Um, and he would send drawings back to the uh, magazine for publication. But he also liked to paint these uh, scenes of camp life in which, uh, in this one, in which, like this one, where he depicts two Union soldiers from a Zouave regiment enjoying a quiet moment, smoking their briar with pipes. And I like to think of this now as a, their quiet moment before they were seized with abdominal cramps and running for the trenches that were dug too close to their water supply. So the connection that I wanna make with this painting is with dysentery. And dysentery refers to any bloody diarrhea that's due to a bacterial uh, cause. Usually it's due to a Shigella species. And it's prevalent among the military during wars due to their unsanitary camp life. There's no immunity, so repeat infections are possible. Infectious diseases like dysentery killed more soldiers in the American Civil War than battle wounds. Uh, not only dysentery, but there was typhus, yellow fever, malaria, uh, wound sepsis, me and even measles and chicken pox. Epidemics in armies have changed the course of history. In the Bible, we read about Sennacherib's siege of Jerusalem. The Lord sent an angel who annihilated every mighty warrior, commander, and officer in the army of the king of Assyria, and he returned in disgrace to his land. It's likely that this passage describes an epidemic amongst his troops. This image is of Toussaint Louverture, the leader of a slave revolt against the French rule in Santo Domingo. And it's from Jacob Lawrence's set, The Life of Toussaint Louverture. It's a set of prints. Um, Louverture's ally in the war against the French army was yellow fever, which decimated the French, the French soldiers while sparing the slave population who already had some immunity to this mosquito-borne virus that was endemic in Africa. The defeat of the French army to yellow fever led directly to Napoleon's decision to abandon the Western Hemisphere altogether and his sale of the Louisiana Territory to the United States. This graph may not be an artwork, but it's a masterpiece nonetheless. This is Menard's famous graph of Napoleon's Russia campaign, and it is considered to be the greatest graphic representation of statistical data ever produced. 
It shows the size of Napoleon's army from the beginning of the failed Russia campaign to the end. The size of the army is represented by the width of this tan bar on the outward march and the width of this black bar on the return march. And it's plotted against scales of distance, temperature, and time. 422,000 soldiers crossed the Neiman River into Russia and 10,000 made the return crossing. The connection I would like to make is with typhus, another epidemic that was common in military campaigns when malnourished men were living in close proximity, conditions that favor susceptibility to typhus and to its spread by human lice. For sure, typhus wasn't the only cause of the attrition of Napoleon's army, but it was an important contributor. Okay, on to our next painting and epidemic. Fire consumed London's famous Houses of Par Parliament that you can barely make out here in the distance. On the night of October 16th, 1834, and Turner was there to witness it and to paint it. He magnified the height of the flames for dramatic effect. So this is our third poll. Which epidemic do you associate with this painting? And I want to give you a clue because this is a tricky one. <clears throat> the connection is with the city of London in the mid 19th century and has nothing to do with the fire. So if anyone would like to submit their responses. Okay. Ah, I think I didn't launch the poll. It should be out I was, there say, now. I was just gonna say, Linda, we just saw it come up on our screen. Okay. So let's give folks a, a couple of uh, a couple of seconds to weigh in. And again, friendly reminder, anybody watching on YouTube, unfortunately you can't participate in the poll there, but guess along with us. We appreciate you doing that. And of course, if you're listening to or watching a later broadcast of this, guess along with us as well as we're about to find out. We'll give folks just a few more seconds there, Linda, as they're casting their votes uh, for which epidemic we're associating with this particular painting. Okay, so now I will share the results with you. And it looks like um, cholera is the leading contender here. And that is, is in fact the um, association that I wanted to make with this painting, which I will explain. But first a little bit about cholera. Cholera was endemic in India. Periodic epidemics were related to religious pilgrimages, which contaminated the water sources along the route and spread the disease. The Hajj pilgrimages to Mecca in Saudi Arabia were also responsible for epidemic outbreaks. Cholera came to Europe in 1830 in the gut of passengers on steamships from India via the Suez Canal and then by railroad where it spread to the major cities of Europe. So just like today where we saw COVID spread so rapidly on cruise ships and through an air travel, again, travel, um, increased travel was key to the spread of cholera. Um, the seventh pandemic of cholera, which began in 1935 and is ongoing, is caused by a less virulent strain called El Tor. So cholera today is not as deadly as it was back then when most people died. The most recent outbreak of cholera was in Haiti in 2010 after the earthquake. Now, unlike plague and smallpox that afflicted all classes of society without discrimination, cholera mostly afflicted the poor due to the squalid, unsanitary living conditions and untreated water supply. In his book, Epidemics and Society, Snowden elaborates on the unbelievably horrible living conditions of the poor in European cities at that time. This was especially so in the lower city of Naples, in stark comparison to how the wealthy lived in the upper city. This profound income disparity contributed to the proliferation of conspiracy theories and violent protests among the poor in response to the public health measures that were imposed on them by imperious public health officials who forcibly removed the ill from their homes and took them to the hospitals where they promptly died. So the poor believed that the epidemic was a conspiracy to kill them and this led to the violent protests and refusal to follow other public health guidelines. Mm -hmm. 
Ah, this was this is a woodcut by Alfred Rethel called The Dance of Death, Death as a Strangler, in which death is depicted as a skeleton who's playing his fiddle here made of bones in the midst of an 1832 Parisian costume ball during a cholera epidemic that killed 20,000 people. Okay, London had three cholera epidemics from in 1832, 1848, and 1854. The reason I chose Turner's painting of London as my connection to cholera was so that I could talk about Dr. John Snow's groundbreaking work in the epidemiology of cholera. During the 1848 epidemic, Dr. Snow showed that there were more cholera cases among Londoners who received their water supply from the Thames River downstream of the city in comparison to those who received the upstream water supply. The downstream water was, of course, contaminated by raw sewage that was being dumped uh, from the city. So this strengthened his hypothesis that the disease was caused by what he called animalcules in the water supply. And remember, this is still before uh, bacteria had been discovered. It was during the 1854 epidemic that he made his major contribution, which was the first use of contact tracing or case finding to identify the source of the infection. And we've all heard so much about contact tracing during the present pandemic. So this is his map of the cholera cases in London. And what he did was he went door to door in the vicinity of the outbreak and he counted the number of cases at each address and then he mapped them. So the height of each of these black bars is proportional to the number of cases in that household. So the distribution of these cases suggested that the Broad Street pump located here uh, was the source of the epidemic. But when he uh, interviewed people, he found that there were a number of cases that were um, located in houses that were actually much closer to another pump. And when he talked to people in those houses, he discovered that they were, in fact, going to the Broad Street pump to get their water because the local folklore was that water from that pump was better. So with this uh, data, he went to the um, city administrators and he convinced them to remove the pump handle and the epidemic ended. So I mentioned before that I chose Turner's painting because I wanted to talk about this milestone in public health. What I didn't know at the time was that Turner himself died of cholera in, in December of 19, 1851. So really at, at the beginning of that 1852 epidemic, um, he got it himself. <laughs> this painting is Gustav Kayabat's masterpiece, Paris Street, rainy day that doesn't hang in the CMA, unfortunately, but it is proudly displayed at the Art Institute of Chicago. So would you be surprised if I told you that were it not for repeated cholera epidemics in Paris, this painting might never have been painting, painted? This might be hyperbole, but allow me to explain. Cholera led directly to the sanitary movement in London and then in Paris. By this time, it was clear to many that there was a connection between filth and disease, but nobody knew exactly what it was. Chadwick was a lawyer and a politician in England, and he conducted a detailed survey of the living conditions of London, which were appalling, and he published it. The result of this study was the Sanitary Report of 1842, now considered a foundational textbook of public health. You might be surprised to know that it immediately became a bestseller. Napoleon III of France was very impressed with Chadwick's, Chadwick's work, and this figured prominently in his plan to rebuild the city of Paris, and it added a sense of urgency to it. So based on this report, Napoleon III and Baron Hausmann, who was redesigning the city of Paris, they developed plans to bring clean water from the countryside via aqueducts and deliver it to homes through underground pipes and to have underground sewers to conduct the waste away from the city rather than dumping it directly into the Seine right there in the middle of Paris. The sanitary report also championed the need for people to have access to exercise and fresh air, so parks were included in the city plans. The influential British arts and culture critic John Ruskin disparaged the painter Rembrandt for his dark palette that was suggestive of dirt, and he praised Turner's paintings for their beautiful depiction of sunlight, declaring his art modern, hygienic, and romantic. Now, the 
Impressionist artists, Monet, and well, the artists who became Impressionists, Monet and Pizarro had gone to London in 1870 to escape the Franco-Prussian War, and they saw Turner's paintings, and they were very influenced by his painterly depiction of light. So he influenced them in the direction of becoming Impressionist painters. The sanitary re, uh, reports emphasis on the healthy outdoors and the public parks inspired landscape painting and gardening. The improved access to train travel enabled Parisians to take day trips to the country to enjoy the outdoors and for artists to paint it. So I think it's fair to say that this societal response to repeated cholera epidemics contributed to the revolution in art that we know as Impressionism. The city of Paris that they painted was all new and therefore a subject of great interest to painters. Now this is a cartoon from the time, uh, from 1869. Cholera is depicted as a giant monster protesting to Hausmann that demolition of old houses in Paris has left him homeless. This was a jibe at critics of Hausmann who complained that public works had created a housing shortage. This was urban renewal, the magnitude of which we have not seen since. In a short span of 20 years, from 1850 to 1870, Paris was entirely rebuilt to become the Paris that we recognize today in this magnificent painting. The next painting on our tour is this portrait of a woman by Amadeo Medigliani. Medigliani studied briefly in Florence and Venice before moving to Paris in 1906, where he was known as a wild and crazy guy. His portraits show the influence of African masks and cubism in their simplified, stylized features and flat geometric planes. His paintings sold for a mere pittance during his lifetime, barely enough for him to buy himself dinner in a cafe. Recently, a Chinese billionaire paid upwards of $170 million for one of his reclining nudes. Medigliani died in a coma of tuberculous meningitis at age 34. So that brings us to tuberculosis. <clears throat> TB has been around forever based on anthropological evidence. After the retreat of the other major epidemics, it became the most important disease of the 19th century. And its upsurge coincided with industrialization and the move of lots of people into the cities, which led to urban crowding. It spreads by aerosolized droplets between people living in close proximity. TB was an epidemic in slow motion because unlike other epidemic diseases, it killed its victims slowly. So it didn't give rise to panic in the population. On the contrary, tuberculosis was highly romanticized by European society. It was believed to be hereditary, or at least that there was a hereditary predisposition to it. So there was no stigma attached to it. The poet John Keats became the poster child for consumption as a marker of high culture. He died very young and very quickly from TB. TB was believed to enhance men's creativity and genius and to enhance women's sexuality. TB became fashionable and the consumptive aesthetic established new ideals of feminine beauty, which were sunken cheeks, pale skin and hollow eyes. Fashions of the day were designed to create the illusion of emaciation with low necklines to exaggerate the length of the neck and the use of corsets to make the clavicle and the shoulder blades protrude so that they would look even thinner. This was the consumptive look. Toulouse-Lautrec painted this uh, painting of young woman at a table or rice powder in 1887, in which a young woman is shown applying rice powder to make her complexion look pale. According to Snowden, quote, this tubercular aesthetic persisted into the 20th century in the gossamer frames, pale faces, and swan-like necks of the women in Amadeo Medigliani's portraits. The pre-Raphaelite group of artists specifically sought out models who were consumptive. Elizabeth Siddell, the model and later wife of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, could be considered the feminine poster child for TB. She died of TB at age 35. After Koch's discovery of mycobacterium 
uh, uh, tuberculosis in 1882, TB lost its romance and became just another dirty disease. So this is where we get the maxim, cover your mouth when you're cough, it comes from TB. And also prohibitions against spitting in the street. There was concern about transmission from library books and, and on public transportation and water fountains. Does this sound familiar with COVID? Uh, beards and mustaches became unfashionable at this time because people were concerned about the bacteria lodging in facial hair. In 1908, the New York City Pub Public Health Department ran a campaign uh, with uh, what they called don't cards. They said, don't give consumption to others. Don't let others give consumption to you. This to me sounds a lot like wear your mask. Your mask protects you and protects others from you. TB is also the first time, uh, first use of mili military metaphors such as uh, battling a disease or war against disease. Despite antibiotics and a lot of successful antibiotics, TB still remains an epidemic threat. In fact, it's a smoldering epidemic in some parts of the world. And because there are drug resistant strains that have emerged, it remains a threat for a pandemic. Alice Neal is an artist who is represented in the CMA collection, but not with this painting. She painted this young man with TB while he was in the hospital after an operation. She elongated his neck and arms to exaggerate his emaciated fig um, figure. Do you see a resemblance between these two portraits? Okay. Uh, I mentioned AIDS earlier in connection with bubonic plague and memento mori, and I won't spend much time on AIDS now, although it deserves an entire lecture. AIDS didn't become the worst pandemic in history because it happened during the age of modern medicine when we had the tools to identify the cause and develop treatments. When AIDS was first recognized as a new entity in 1982, we didn't know what was causing the immunodeficiency that made affected individuals so susceptible to opportunistic infections and rare cancers. Extensive contact tracing in the homosexual community provided the first clue that an infectious agent was spreading from person to person by sexual contact. The second clue was that an RNA virus had recently been discovered as the cause of a very rare form of leukemia affecting T cells. And it was the same T cells that were so drastically reduced in patients with AIDS. The scientific methods for detecting RNA viruses had already been developed in cancer research. So once they knew what to look for, they had the tools to find it very quickly. Despite successful therapy, there is still no effective vaccine against HIV. And one of the reasons for that is because this virus mutates a lot. And we're hearing a lot about the coronavirus mutating. However, that vaccine research that had been done on HIV and on, on some other recent viral epidemics, such as SARS and Zika and Ebola, have enabled researchers to develop effective vaccines against the COVID virus uh, so quickly because they already had the tools at their disposal. So AIDS has had a dramatic impact on the arts and on society, and we've all witnessed this in our lifetime. First, it expanded the use of art as very personal expressions of loss and grief, as we saw in the Holzer and Gonzalez Torres works. And secondly, it expanded the use of art as very public expressions of, um, of social and political activism. Art has always been used for political purposes. Recall the painting by, of Napoleon but usually by those in power, not by those who lack power and wanted to be heard. The AIDS Memorial Quilt is an enormous memorial that celebrates the lives of people who have died of AIDS related causes. Each quilt is, a three, by six, is three feet by six feet, approximately the same size as an average grave. It weighs an estimated 54 tons and is the largest piece of community folk art in the world. The quilt was first laid on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. in 1987, and today it memorializes over 94,000 individuals who lost their lives to AIDS-related causes, and it is kept in San Francisco. This brings us to our, the final painting on the tour, one of my favorite paintings in the CMA collection, 
Stag at Sharkies by George Bellows. And here we see a live sporting event attended by a crowd of people with a complete lack of social distancing and lots of yelling. So this could be a potential super spreader event for influenza or COVID. So I wanna talk a little bit about the influenza uh, pandemic of 1918, because we've uh, heard a lot about this recently in comparison with the COVID pandemic. So the influenza viruses are highly infectious and spread by respiratory droplets like COVID. In 1918, the presence of American, European, and African troops in Northern France created an opportunity for the spread of an epidemic of unprecedented scope. It spread rapidly around the world, killing um, approximately 600,000 in the United States and greater than 20 million worldwide. I just noted that in the papers last week, we are at 600,000 deaths in the United States right now for from COVID. Wherever it hit, the health services were immediately overwhelmed, but it passed rapidly and life then returned to normal. Now, many artists and their families were afflicted and many died. So one of the major uh, impacts on the arts was the artists that we lost in influenza. So here are some artworks by artists represented in the CMA collection who had influenza during that 1918 pandemic. While working as a war artist, John Singer Sargent was laid up at a military hospital with influenza, where he recovered alongside both gassed and sick soldiers. In this watercolor interior of a hospital tent, the different color beds indicate whether the patient was contagious or not. I'm guessing the red beds were for those who were contagious. Edvard Munch painted this ghostly self-portrait on the left while he had the flu, and he also painted a self-portrait after he recovered. This painting hangs at the Metropolitan in New York. In the center is a photograph by Ansel Adams. He took this photograph of Mount McKinley many years after he had recovered from the flu. And on the right is a painting by the Austrian artist, Egon Schiele. This painting uh, was unfinished on his easel when he died in 1918 at age 35. He died three weeks after his pregnant wife had died of the flu. This was to be a family portrait with his as yet unborn child. He used his nephew to model in this painting. Gustav Klimt, who was his mentor, probably also died from complications of the flu. And finally, uh, this painting, uh, I'm rather uh, this uh, photograph of um, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, uh, was taken by Alfred Stieglitz when she was recovering from the flu. And you can see she looks a little bit ill there. So, um, you know, the question of whether or not there were lasting impacts of influenza on art is a difficult question to answer because it's so rolled up with World War I and it's difficult to separate the effects of the epidemic from the effects of the war. Um, However, some have suggested that the combination of the war and the pandemic led to a pervasive sense of chaos, absurdity, and the meaninglessness of life. And the art movements that came out of this time period explored this sense of hopelessness and reactions to it. So the Dada movement seized on absurdity as an inspiration, and the Bauhaus movement rejected frivolity in uh, ornamentation and design and turned to practicality and utility. And abstract art can be interpreted uh, as an escape from reality itself. So in conclusion, I hope that I've convinced you that pandemics have had a major impact on the visual arts. And the magnitude of the impact appears to be related to how well the epidemic connects with prevailing social issues and attitudes. So this oversimplified list highlights some of the social issues that coincided with some of the epidemics I discussed and that may have influenced artists of those eras. During the winter months when I presented this talk, I ended with this painting, a recent new acquisition to the museum because I think it, it conveys the sense of isolation that we felt in our households during those gray months of the winter. But now that summer is here and the vaccine is here and we're all coming outdoors again and we're able to go places without wearing our masks, I want to end on this more cheerful image. And I would like to leave you to ponder these questions 
Um, will COVID-19 have a lasting impact on art? And what do you think are the prevailing social attitudes today that might influence its impact? And with that, I will end my presentation to you. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Dr. Sandhouse, we thank you so much for that presentation. Um, you know, what a massive amount of research you've done coupling uh, art with the impact of pandemics on it uh, to take us through the ages, really to take a look at that. And uh, by gosh, you must be a mind reader as well, because one of the audience questions that came in early via email was actually asking that very thing to you. What do you think the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic will be to art? Uh, so I, I think we want to turn your question back to you again and just hear uh, you, perhaps your top takeaway or top three takeaways as we're still grappling through the pandemic. I know we're not in a post COVID-19 world yet, but looking at it where we are now, like you said, through a lens of hope, vaccine rates still going up, uh, more and more folks becoming vaccinated, uh, more and more restrictions being lifted. And, um, you know, we're engaging in behavior uh, that we have not yet been able to engage in during the pandemic, uh, what are your top takeaways of you think the impact will be uh, from COVID-19 to art? You know, it's a great question. And I really uh, encourage you to talk about it because, you know, sometimes we don't see what the impact is until many, many years later. So it's hard to predict. I'm not sure. We certainly have a lot of societal issues that we're dealing with now. Um, political issues, um, you know, racial issues, a lot of things that we're talking about. And it's hard to predict how the epidemic is going to connect with these social issues. So I think, you know, 20 years from now, we'll be able to look back and answer that question. But right now, I don't really know. Well, I think maybe that's a, a great opportunity to turn the question to artists who are working through this and seeing what they're producing through these times. And I think one of our uh, one of our viewers has a question here, you know, uh, taking a look at art right now, uh, noting your connection to Cleveland and the Cleveland Museum of Art, asking if you're organizing art walks, because now is the opportunity for folks, uh, you know, to be able to re-engage in uh, gathering spaces and, and outside and some inside uh, but are you hosting any organizing walks that maybe uh, our Erie audience or folks tuning in from Cleveland uh, or anywhere else throughout the country might be able to join you on? Well, I wouldn't say art walks so much as art tours. Um, the CMA is opening up more. They had suspended all um, in-person gatherings, uh, organized activities at the museum, but the, in starting in July, they will um, be offering docent tours again. So there will be daily tours by docents, um, myself included, at one o'clock and at 1.30. Um, I actually intend to uh, give some art and epidemics tours in person so we can be, you can uh, join me <laughs> and look at, at these artworks in person and, and we can talk about some of these connections. Um, there's also a, a, a new exhibition that's opening very soon at the museum. Uh, about the Nobbies. Um, I can't remember off, but I shouldn't know what the name of the exhibit is, but it's about a group of, of uh, post-impressionist painters who called themselves the Nobbies, and they painted typical daily scenes in the home, very intimate scenes in the home. And it's very much connected with what we've all been going through in the last uh, year, being at home and um, finding you know, mundane activities at home. So I think that all of us will really connect well with this exhibit and I, um, I encourage you to come to the CMA and, and see it. And, and hopefully people will. I'd encourage them to do that as well, uh, to check out, uh, you know, all of that and more uh, that Cleveland has to offer and uh, to be able to, to plug into, uh, you know, the, the things that are happening there. And, and one of the things happening in, in this presentation, and, and we got this question early in advance as well, Linda, uh, you noting uh, this person noting your unique position to comment on this because of your background as a physician and, and now a docent at the museum. So they were wondering what first drew you to make the connection here uh, to, to taking a look at public health through the lens of art and how epidemics have impacted art. What drew you to do this program? <laughs> so that's a great question and I'm delighted that you asked it. You know, I was trained um, by the education department at the museum to give school children tours, you know, school tours. And 
the uh, what they really emphasized in that training was how to help people make their own personal connections to artwork because that's how we really enjoy art whether we realize it or not and i hadn't realized it myself we're drawn to things that we feel a personal connection with and um so when the pandemic happened and my background being in medicine it was kind of a natural thing for me to make connections to medicine and art. And what motivated me to do it was uh, medical students. I'm on a committee with the uh, medical school. Uh, they have a humanities program. And uh, so I wanted to put together something that would engage the medical students with the collection. And so I thought, okay, I can uh, come up with some artworks that I can match up with epidemics and I can ask the medical students to figure out what the connection is. So that's what we did with the students. Uh, again, the museum at that time was closed, so we had to do it as a virtual tour, but uh, they had some fun with it, figuring out what was the connection. And that's in fact how I learned that Turner died from cholera. I hadn't hmm. found that in my research, but the medical students did. Fascinating. They Googled it. <laughs> It, well, that's fascinating. And I've got to follow up to say, was there an initial painting that caught your eye, a piece of art that really spoke to you that said, I think I've got something here. And then you began to work it through the ages. Uh, was there one particular artwork that spoke first or was it a chorus of pieces just speaking to you all at once? It was, it was the idea. It started with the idea. And then I just walked through the galleries and said, okay, what can I connect with what? Um, and then, so Venice was the, the, the painting of Venice was the first one that I saw. And uh, I, I mentioned that someone in, in the audience made the connection of cholera with Venice. Great connection. It just wasn't the one I chose to make, but, um, but that's also a great connection to Venice. And, and we covered so much here in the given time, and I appreciate all you've done, uh, Dr. Sandhouse. And, and so I, I want to leave you with one final question. And maybe it's back to our first one, thinking in our contemporary times, that impact of COVID-19 uh, on art. But I, I suppose I want to step back for a second and say, you know, if we're looking at all of history, all of what you've just covered and the impact of uh, epidemics on art and how artists have interpreted it and left behind these beautiful works, some haunting, stirring as well for us to contemplate on. If folks tuning in to this program, either watching it live or streaming it on demand are to take away one, two, maybe three things from it. What do you hope that they carry with them out of this program and hold on to until tomorrow? Well, I drew a lot of connections between previous pandemics and the current one. And that was my biggest takeaway. Not even so much the art, but just that to the reactions and that we're having to this pandemic are so similar to what's happened in the past. Um, and that is just always an astonishing thing to learn about history and what makes learning history so fascinating to me. We have so much to learn from yesterday, today to help us get through tomorrow. And what better way to do that than to turn to art? And so for that, Dr. Linda Sandhouse, thank you, thank you, thank you. Physician now docent at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Thank you for that virtual tour, walking us through it and helping us to understand our past so that we can better see today and better anticipate tomorrow. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and insight with us here at the JES Digital Stage. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My pleasure, Ben. Bye. And of course, to all of you watching along at home, uh, we thank you for tuning in these programs and discussions and the exchange of information and ideas would not be possible without you. So thank you, thank you, thank you, folks. And folks, for more information about the JES, uh, please do visit our website, jeserie.org. Uh, you're also going to find videos of past presentations available to stream on demand, as well as publications, including reports, essays, and timely writings, as well as information about other JES initiatives, such as our Civic Leadership Academy and Ramey Fellows Program. Uh, be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you're watching there and aren't already subscribed. We welcome you to do that. Uh, so for the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound. And thanks for listening and